Last week we began to talk a little bit about show us the Father. And I'm not going to turn there, but I, I, want, I do want to rehash some things this morning to get us to where uh, we are going this morning. You know, most people have a, an image of God, an image of God the Father out of the Old Testament, and an image of the Lord Jesus Christ out of the New Testament. And there is a lot of variation between what we see in the old and what we see in the new. And how do we conceptualize and bring those things together in our own thoughts of who God is. And so that's why last week uh, and this week and maybe next week, I don't know, I, I, I just really have this on my heart right now is that, you know, in John chapter 14, Philip asked Jesus, he said, show us the Father. And Jesus said, Philip, have you been with me these three and a half years? And do you not know the Father? He that has seen me has seen the Father. So Jesus, in John 17 and in John 14, I, I mean, all through the Gospels, Jesus compared himself with the Father. He said, me and the Father are one. And so we're going to have to relook at who God is. We're going to have to take a, another look and we're going to have to continue to see God the way that Jesus presented him in the Gospels. There is going to have to be a clarity that comes to our life. And uh, I actually, uh, this morning, you know, I want to start off with what Robin read earlier. We read this last week, I know, but this is where I want to start this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 11. And verse 28, I'm going to read it out of the New King James. Robin read it out of the Message Bible this morning, and, and it is good. There's, a, there's an element of rest, and there's a lot of things that we could talk about. This Bible is full of principles and concepts and paradigm shifts and, and, and things that we can enter into, but we've got to be open for those things to transpire. And uh, I love what it says out of the message, but I'm going to read it out of the, out of the uh, New King James. It says, All things have been delivered to me, in verse 27, by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Then it says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Jesus was talking to people who was under an old covenant system, a system of laws and rules and regulation, a system of wrath, a system of sacrifices. I mean, they, they had been burdened down. They had been heavy laden. The, the Old Testament was a, was a violent place to be living in for 4,000 years from the time that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and gave way to Lucifer and, and Lucifer began to have power and authority on the earth to do damage uh, to the children uh, of God here on this planet. You know, uh, it was violent back there. And so Jesus, whenever Jesus entered the scene, not only, not only was the Old Testament violent, but Jesus walked into a religious system who, who was violent as well. They entered into that violence because they misunderstood, they misapplied, they misappropriated the things that were happening in the Old Testament. They didn't understand everything that God was trying to do. God was trying to get Jesus into the earth so that a new understanding of who he really was could be presented because from the time of Adam and Eve until the time that Jesus entered the scene, there was a marring, there was a twisting of who God was, of who the Father was, of His loving kindness, of His patience, of His mercy. We, think, we see things in the Old Testament that causes us to doubt who God really is. But Jesus was God in the flesh. He, was, he manifested God the Father. I've, I've said this for years, is that, you know, as I was coming out of the Baptist church into the charismatic church, and, and some things in the charismatic word of faith movement wasn't no better than what I got in the denominations. That's right. 
manner to that. Because our concept of God is changing. We are growing. We are maturing. We are growing in the grace of God. We are understanding things more completely and more fully. The knowledge of God is being opened up to mankind. It's not that He was hiding it from us. He has been hiding it for us. If we would just search it, we would have found it. Look at somebody and say, God's not hiding anything from me. That's how Adam and Eve fell in the garden is they thought that God was withholding or hiding something from them. And Lucifer convinced them that God was withholding from them because he said, it, when you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll become like God. My submission to you, and I know you've heard me say it a thousand times, but they were like God. It says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Man, that sounds really good to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn, learn from me. Learn from Jesus. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Hebrews says that this rest is this new covenant of rest is the anchor for my soul. It's what gives me emotional stability. I don't know about you, but this week I ran into a number of people who were emotionally unstable. Did you run into anybody who was emotionally unstable? I can't afford to enter into other people's instability. Jesus never allowed himself to enter into the unrest and the unstableness that he found the earth in whenever he came because him and the Father were one. He said, I'm not doing what I'm doing because I'm doing it on my own. The Father in me, he does the works. He's saying the words. Jesus presented a different God than anybody had ever seen up to that time. He presented a God who would, who would bring you into a place of rest and a place of ease and a place of being uh, unburdened. And that's powerful to me. And so we, we found out last week that in Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4, that literally Jesus was the exact representation of the Father. Turn over to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Man, I could preach all day long. As long as my voice would hold out, I could stay here as long as you would listen to me. I was waiting for a yes, hallelujah, praise the Lord, Pastor Terry. All we're going to do is go home and watch the Chiefs game who is going to beat the Jaguars today. Praise the Lord, this is our year. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Oh, okay, all right. You all aren't as amused about this as I am. How many football fans do I have in here today? All right. We, we got Broncos, we got Dallas Cowboys, we got Chiefs. Anybody else? Oakland Raiders. Oakland, ooh, Oakland Raiders, wow. Woo. The arch rivals of the Chiefs. You say, Pastor Terry, what are you talking about this morning? Listen to me. Our concept of God has to change in order for us to really enter into a rest. We've got to begin to understand the fullness of everything that Jesus presented. In 2 Peter chapter 1, in uh, uh, verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, You've already got all the faith of Jesus because you've got Him living on the inside of you. You have like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace will be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God or in the correct and vital knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Whenever you understand the correct and vital knowledge of God, you will understand Jesus our Lord, because the two are one. That, I, if I don't get off of that this morning, I, I'm going to stay on that until we begin to understand that and come into the fullness of that. As His divine power has 
given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So that's telling me right there that Jesus corrected the problem, the problem of grace and peace being multiplied to us as we understand who the Father is and who Jesus is and we understand the 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 concepts and and the paradigms shifting from the old covenant to the new covenant that God has always been the same. He doesn't change. How he's had to deal with the human race has been different. But see, this tells me that as his divine power today has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the correct and vital knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you might be partakers of what you've already been given, the divine nature of God on the inside of you, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This says that God corrected the problem in Jesus and a knowledge of God the Father and God the Son that has given everything. See, he's not withholding anything. Do you understand that? He's not withholding you. Pastor Trey, I'm, I'm sick in my body today. I don't care. I don't care what it looks like on the outside. He is not withholding from you. The Bible says that you're already healed through a correct and vital knowledge of God. You know, there was, a, there was some things in the Gospels and there's all kinds of places that I could go here. But one guy came to Jesus and he said, Lord, if it's your will, heal me. Jesus said, I will. Guess what it was? If Jesus said, I will, then guess what God's will was? God's will is I will because Jesus and God are one. God has always been the same from, from before he created Adam and Eve until the end of Revelation, generation, generation after generation. Genesis to Revelation, God has always been the same. The Bible says in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, Jesus said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if that's Jesus, then that's the Father. See, our concept of the old covenant God versus the new covenant Jesus, they have to be in are mingled and we have to begin to be able to see some things so that grace and peace will be multiplied to us. My Father is Jesus. Jesus is my Father. They are one together. And guess what? Those of us that have obtained like precious faith, we are one with Him. Not going to be. Already are. Praise God. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about my dream. I told you I was going to do that, didn't I? Yes. Before I, before I get there, let me... Let, 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 me, let me make this statement that I made last week. Because this is so simple, I, and I've been, you know, over the years I've read hundreds of commentaries and things about how, how we uh, examine the Old Testament and how we look at God in the Old Testament and then we try to mesh it with the New Testament. And man, I tell you, we've come up with a weird God. And my statement is, will the real God Please stand up. From the time I was a young man, I saw the love of Jesus in the New Testament. I saw the wrath of God in the Old Testament. Listen, our concept of who God the Father is is going to have to change. You say, well, Pastor Jerry, how do we do that? Here it is. There was a lot of things that happened in the Old Testament And we talked a little bit about this last week. There was a lot of things that happened in the Old Testament that wasn't God's will. It wasn't His best. However, what was done had to be done because God was working with the will of men. God was working with ungenerated man who had lost the life of God. God was trying to get life back into the earth because He loved the human race. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That was God's plan before the foundations of the world, before anybody ever did anything wrong. God loved us. God loves every one of us. No matter how not-headed some of us have been. 
God had to do the things that he did in the Old Testament to get Jesus into the earth. Remember what I read out of, out of Luke chapter 9 about James and John? You know, they thought that they were, they thought they were all of that and a little bit more. And, and there were some Samaritans that rejected Jesus and, and they said, Jesus, do you want us to call fire down out of heaven and consume them? And, and, and all they were doing was emulating an Old Testament prophet who called fire down out of heaven on 102 innocent guys. And I don't want to re-preach that from last week, but I want to make this statement. 102 innocent people died, but let me tell you something. In the New Testament, whenever they tried to emulate an Old Testament prophet, Jesus Jesus said, you guys don't know what spirit you're of. I did not come to, to kill people. I have come to save them. So my, my point is, is if Jesus would have been manifested in the, in the person that he was in the Gospels, he would have rebuked Elijah for doing what he did. Oh, Pastor Jerry, let us call a little fire down on people. Look at somebody and say, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Will the real God please stand up? See, there's, there, there was a war. Turn over to Genesis 3.15. Turn over to Genesis 3.15. How many of you know Lucifer started a war in the garden? He declared war on God by attacking man with his propaganda. God responded not by, not by hiding from man, but he came to man. He came to the garden searching him out. Man wasn't looking for him at that point. Man was scared, afraid, fearful. And that fear has been on the earth. First John chapter 4, we've looked at this. Perfect love casts out all fear, for fear has torment. I don't want to operate in fear. I don't want to operate in torment. But see, God came to Adam and Eve in the garden and he said to them in, uh, in verse 14, he said to the serpent, in verse 14, he said, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this to Adam and Eve, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. There's some things that, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now my new King James says he shall bruise your head. That is, that is really, um, your King James may say something different, but they, they should have translated that a, another word because this word he, in, in the new King James it says he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The second bruise is right. The first bruise is wrong and they put them like they're synonymous with one another. They are not. The first word bruise literally means that Jesus once and for all was going to come into the earth and crush the power and the authority. He was going to stomp on Satan's head once and for all and take his authority and his power from him that he had gained from Adam and Eve. Yes, Lucifer bruised his heel on the cross. And the cross was not, listen to me, the cross was not the devil taking Jesus to the cross. It was the plan of God all along. Everybody say God the Father and Jesus are one. See, where was God the Father at? In, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 18, 19, it says, God was in Christ reconciling just a few holy people unto himself. No, he reconciled the world. Everybody. Somebody say everybody. I think this thing totally looks different than what anybody thinks. Amen. See, there was a war going on and God said, okay, you've declared war on me by attacking man. Satan, I'm declaring war on you and my son, the seed of the woman, the seed of Mary, my son who is going to be holy and pure is going to come into the earth and crush your power and authority and redeem mankind. Do you know that it was so important? I can't even... I, the, the word important, it doesn't even say what I want to say. It was critical. It was important for God to get Jesus into the earth. Amen. 
And it took 4,000 years for God to do that. Galatians 4 says, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. There was a war. And in the middle of a war, in the middle of a war, things are done. Innocent people get killed. There's casualties. I love my wife. She is so awesome with kids. Now, let, now let, me, let me say this. Jesus ended the war. I, I'm going to say that again. I said Jesus did what God prophesied in Genesis 3.15. On the cross, he crushed Satan. And whenever your head is crushed, baby, you're not going to get up off the floor. Amen. He is down. He is defeated. Amen. Do you know what our problem is? Right between our ears, our concept of God, our concept of Jesus, our concept of the new covenant that we're in. Jesus already took care of everything. This is such good news. I just want to run. Our God is a great big God. Come on. I'm about to start worshiping with them guys. <laughs> see, here's, a, here's, here's our problem is that, see, even under the ministry of Jesus, James and John had been with Jesus for three and a half years and they were wanting to call fire down out of heaven because that's all they had seen in the old covenant. Right. Jesus said, no, guys, it ain't this way. See, they were still operating under an old covenant mentality. Most of the church today is operating under an old covenant mentality. Not a new covenant grace and peace mentality because our concept of who we think God is, we don't know God. But I'm telling you, some of us are heading in that direction. Whenever Peter, in Acts chapter 5, I, I did not, I was not going to do this, but I am. I'm just going to touch on it. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. You remember Ananias and Sapphira? Man, you talking about, I have heard messages taking up offerings <laughs> with Ananias and Sapphira. Craig Smith came back from uh, somewhere in the Spanish world and, and he gave me a picture. I don't have it this morning, but the picture was of this guy that had a, uh, an, uh, he had a saying on the front of his shirt. It said, tithe or die. And then underneath it had Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Man, I've been in services where, where uh, people have preached that Listen, listen to me. If you don't give today, God's going to be, we're going to be carrying body bags out. Listen, 6%, only 6 to 7% of the church actually gives 10% in any given offering in any given church. It is a known fact. There wouldn't be anybody alive. I'm telling you, our concept of who God is is going to have to change. But you know what? Peter was coming out of an old covenant mentality. Paul hadn't written the New Testament epistles yet. Paul hadn't had his revelation yet of Jesus. He was still killing Christians all over the place because he thought he knew God. He didn't know God. You can think you know God and think that you're doing God's service, but not really doing God's service. Romans chapter 10 says, Paul said in Romans chapter 10, he said the Jews had a zealousness for God, but an inaccurate understanding of who God was. Wow. Peter, that day, was coming out of an old covenant mentality. He was still operating to a certain extent under law. God hadn't showed him yet, hadn't even showed him yet that the Gentiles were in on this thing. For God so loved the world, Peter. 
God had to show Peter through letting down the sheets, listen, everybody's going to get in on this, not just you Jews. See, God's plan all along was for the whole world. Not just the Jews, but God used the Jews to get Jesus into the earth. Am I making sense this morning? Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me real quick go over to, uh, wow, go over to Galatians chapter 1. I tell you that, it really set me free whenever I understood what really happened with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. And there's other, there's other situations in the New Testament because we have not understood some things. We, we, throw a, we, throw a bad, we throw a bad light on God. Matter of fact, James says that as far as God is concerned, James chapter 1, there is no variation with God. He is light. He is pure. There's not even any shadow with God. Look at somebody and say, God doesn't even have a shadow. God is such pure light and so, so pure and holy that he is perfect, he is loving, and he is kind. I reject the fact that God is judgment. God is not judgment. God is love. Out of his love, sometimes judgment has had to come. But can I tell you something? Any of the judgment that has come under the Old Testament was taken care of at the cross. We are no longer under judgment. The judgment of this world has already come according to John chapter 16. The prince of darkness have already been crushed. Everybody found Galatians chapter 1. L listen to this. Uh, let's start with verse 14. This is one of Paul's eloquent messages about not mixing grace and law in, in, in the book of Galatians. And he says in uh, Galatians chapter 1 verse 11, he says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel, the good news of grace, because that's what he's talking about in the book of Galatians, the good news of grace which was preached by me is not according to man. Well, of course it isn't. Of course it isn't. Because man's thought is judgment. God's thought is mercy. Amen. God's thought was mercy to get Jesus into the earth to redeem the entire human race. Look at somebody and say, there's going to be a lot of people in heaven. Matter of fact, let me go one step further. There's going to be people in heaven that you don't want there. You need to change your mind. There's going to be people in heaven that you had a hard time with on earth. They're going to be right there with us. <laughs> look, look at this. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if he had a revelation of Jesus Christ, guess what? He had a revelation of God the Father. And this was, Jesus was already uh, born, lived his life, crucified, raised from the dead, and seated back with the Father. And now Jesus was back on the earth in the form of the Holy Spirit. Look at somebody and say the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit was ministering to Paul. I really believe that Jesus was with Paul for a number of years uh, physically. I believe Jesus was in, in, a, in a manifested state in front of Paul. That's what I believe. You can believe what you want. But whatever happened, he had a revelation of Jesus Christ. He wasn't with the disciples for three and a half years, but he had a greater revelation of Jesus than they had while they were walking with him. Well, Pastor Terry, you can't have no revelation of God and Jesus. You, I know where you graduated from high school. You went to Fordland. You're just an old country boy. You, you, even had, you even had, even, haven't even had much schooling. You, you went to Bible school a couple of years, but you can't know all these things. I'll trade your Bible school one for my Holy Ghost that lives on the inside of me. <laughs> Listen to this. 
For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. Yeah, Paul, we, we knew you as Saul. How I persecuted the church of God beyond measure. And I tried to destroy it. See, he thought he knew God. He didn't. But he had a revelation of Jesus and now his concept of who God is changed. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But it, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And I believe Paul was with Jesus for, for, for quite a while. He didn't go up and check with James and John. They were the ones calling fire down on everybody. He didn't check with Peter to see if it was, what he was preaching was okay because Peter was still killing people. Come on. Amen. Yeah. Everybody smile real, real big. Amen. Come on. Let me see it. <laughs> Come on. Am I making sense? See, Paul prayed in Ephesians 1 that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. He didn't pray that God would uh, move in so that we could have revival. Do you know the only thing holding revival back from the C of O campus is that the eyes of people's understanding would be enlightened. That they might know what is the hope of their calling and what is the riches of His glory that is in us as saints. See, we, we've got people all over, the, and I've been involved with it. You know, the, the God starts moving in one area, and everybody goes to Brownsville. Did anybody ever hear about Brownsville? Well, God's moving in Brownsville. Well, wait a minute. Isn't God here? Doesn't he live in me? I don't need to go to Brownsville to have God moving in my life. What I need to do is have a little bit of the renewal of the mind and begin to know what Paul knew, begin to have a revelation of Jesus Christ. And you say, I already got it together. Right. <laughs> See, see, I believe, I believe that as we begin to pursue God in our personal relationship, you'll get so on fire that you don't need to go to a meeting to get fired up. See, I don't go to Pat. I'm getting ready to go to Lynn House uh, Conference in West Virginia. Praise the Lord at the end of the month. But I'm not going there to get fired up. He can't. Uh, now, I'm sure he'll fire me up a little bit more, but I, I, I'm not going there to get fired up. I'm not going there, you know, because I'm just barely dragging in as a pastor. Oh my God, it's so terrible having people in your church and I don't know if we're going to, I don't know if we're going to make it or not. No, I, I, I'm, I'm alive. I'm well. See, I don't take on your problems. Hello. Amen. 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 That's why I can stay at rest. That's why I can comfort you in the middle of your stuff. Amen. That's why I won't beat you up. Amen. Hello. Amen. Everybody say, show us the Father. Show us the Father. Wow. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 2. I know you've read this. This used to bother me greatly. Because I didn't understand that everything that was going on in the Old Covenant, and there's a number of explanations that I could give you that I'm not going to this morning, but there's a number of explanations that I could give you as I begin to read chapter 2, and I want us to read verses 3 and 4. But before, before we read that, let me, let me go a little bit further with uh, Paul's revelation. In chapter 1, he prayed that your eyes would be opened. In, in chapter 2, he said, But God, who is rich in mercy with his great love with which he loved us. Does that sound like that he had a revelation of the love of God? 
Chapter 3, he prayed. What did he pray? In chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, that we would come into an understanding of the heights and the depths and the breadths and the lengths of his love. Because in doing that, you would be filled with the fullness of God, of who he is. And then... Paul had all this revelation and you know he wrote the New Testament but he wrote the New Testament the New Testament writers wrote the New Testament they didn't have the New Testament they wrote the New Testament out of the Old Testament all the signs and symbols and the revelation of Jesus is in the Old Testament there were types and shadows that pointed so that Paul could write it down by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost he got a hold of it everybody say got a hold of it Are you ready for this? This is God in the Old Testament to the children of Israel. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then when we turn and journeying into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me, and we skirted Mount Seir for many days, and the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have skirted this mountain long enough. Turn northward. You command the people, saying, that you are about to pass through the territory of your brethren and descendants of Esau who live in Seir. And they will be afraid of you. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Actually, I think I have the wrong. Hang on just a second here. First Samuel chapter 15. Everybody say, I'm okay. Well, there's a number of places in the Old Testament that God told them to do this. But it, in chapter 15 and verse 2, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek. Now listen to this. This is God. And utterly destroy all that they have. And do not spare them. But kill both man and woman infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. There's a number of things out of the Old Testament that says these things. Has any of you ever read that? Yeah. Anybody ever had a hard time with that? Yeah. There's a number of things that I could say about this, but let me, let me make one statement. Getting Jesus in the earth was at stake. If Israel, any time they went into some of these heathen countries, and it, whenever Israel went in and they would marry their daughters and their, and their daughters would marry the evil people's sons, they would bring their negative things into the camp of Israel. See, that, what's at stake here is Jesus coming into the earth. What was at stake in the flood of Noah was Jesus coming into the earth. There was only one man that would, would, that would believe God at this point. Yeah. And what if God did everything that he did, even in the Old Testament, thinking there's coming a day that Jesus is going to come into the earth, my son is going to crush the head of Satan, the war will be over. Praise God. Right. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. In a war, in, innocent people get killed. But God had to get Jesus in the earth. Is God killing people today? No. Is Florida going to drop off into the ocean because we've got a high, uh, high amount of homosexuals there? No. Is God judging America? No. I heard a preacher just say a couple of weeks ago, if... if, uh, if if God does not judge America, then he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I will, take it I will take it to another level. If God judges America, he will have to apologize to his son Jesus because Jesus took the judgment and the wrath of God so that that would be cleared. Do you see how our concept of God needs to change? And see, I could get up here and I could read to you all kinds of scriptures out of the Old Testament and by the time you left here, you would be, you would be so crazy, you'd want to... Hit you. Hit me, yeah. 
Am I making sense today? Yes. Look at somebody and say, God is good. God is See, but God has always been good. Do you understand that? It was Jesus was God's idea. God loves Terry Bench. If I never preach another message, if I never win another person to Christ, if I don't pastor a church, God loves me. Not based upon my performance, but based upon the performance of one man who did it good enough to clear me. But can I tell you, it was God's idea to clear me. He loved me before Jesus cleared me. That's why Jesus came. Is anybody glad you came today? I, I told you I was going to tell you my dream. Right? This happened last Thursday and Friday. Not this last week, but before last Sunday. I think because I've been studying some of these things, I was with Christian and Davey and Bill. And we were decked out in our Israeli outfits. So I guess that means we were Israelis. I had a dream that was full color, vividly. We had swords in our hands. And our leader told us, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go in and we're going to kill everybody. We're going to kill the women. We're going to kill the children. We're going to kill the infants. We're going to kill the nursing. We're going to kill everybody. And Davy looked at me. Christian looked at Bill. We looked at each other. And it was like, okay. We, we have no idea what's going on here. We were Old Testament people. Okay. They didn't understand the mysteries like we, we have the mysteries written down. We didn't understand it. So you know what we did? We just obeyed orders. Yeah. Amen. Wow. The law. We, we didn't want to do it. Christian didn't want to. I didn't want to do it. Davy didn't want to do it. Bill didn't want to do it. But we did what we were told. Amen. I mean, this was a vivid dream. I'm, I'm going to stop right there. And God told me, he said, I didn't have any other choice. He said, what was at stake was Jesus coming into the earth to redeem mankind. I was working with you guys who were unregenerate for 4,000 years. There was time, times that the bloodline, the thread got so small. Noah was the only one left. Right. In the time of Noah that would believe God. God always has to have someone in the earth believing and always has to have someone in the earth speaking out his stuff. Even Mary, whenever the angel came to Mary, Mary said Mary had already been versed in things. She knew that there was going to be a handmaiden in the earth That's right. that was going to have the Savior. I think she believed that she was the one. And she told, she told the angel of the Lord, so be it unto me according to your word. Amen. She had to cooperate with God. Right. Look at somebody and say, I want to cooperate with God. I want to cooperate with God. See, if, if we just give God a little bit of something, if we believe who we are and if we change our mind about who God is, then He's going to live out of us. Have I made sense this morning? Yes. Do you understand if Jesus had not come into the earth, we would all be lost in without God? Right. Ephesians 1 says that we were all without hope and without God, separated from Him. Even Israel was and they didn't recognize it. Because there's only one way to the Father. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that He did. 
Come on, stand up with me.